Very good morning to you uh, again and a, a warm welcome to uh, this time on a, on a Sunday morning where we can uh, meet together and join together and fellowship together and spend some time looking uh, at the Word of God as we're going to do this morning and praying uh, to the Lord together on this Sunday morning. Uh, so very warm welcome and it's, it's good to see you all and uh, good to be with you all this first Sunday in, in March, the beginning of, uh, of spring as we look once again, as we continue to look really at the opening few verses of 1 John and chapter 1, as we've been looking at over these last couple of weeks. We've been looking at the uh, the person of Jesus. We've been looking at his divine nature. And we are looking specifically over these last couple of weeks at his humanity, the humanity of Jesus. And we're going to read those opening verses to start us off. This morning, again, from the book of John or the first epistle of John and chapter one. Let's read them together to remind us of what we've looked at and to, to see where we are this morning. One John and ver- chapter one and verse one says this. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. As I say we've been looking at the humanity of Jesus um, last week, and that's what we're going to do this week. But last week, we looked at uh, the wonderful fact that in his humanity, Jesus was able to sympathize with us. He is able, excuse me, to understand the things that we go through day by day and, and week by week in our lives, the things that we go through in our humanity. We saw that he understands what it means to be tired, what it means to be disappointed, what it means to be joyful, what it means to be tempted. We spent a little bit of time looking at that last week, didn't we? We looked at that verse from Hebrews last week, which says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. In all points, says the word of God, says the writer to the Hebrews, in all ways, tempted as we are. And so he is able to understand the things that we go through. He is able to sympathize and to empathize with us in the struggles of life. And this week, I want us to move on from there and to think about that next phrase in that verse of Hebrews. Let's read it again to ourselves to remind us we do not have a high priest says Hebrews who cannot sympathize with our weakness but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin in all ways tempted the same as you and I are yet without sin and it's that last phrase that I want us just to spend a few moments this morning looking at yet He is without sin. And that's such an important phrase, isn't it? When we come to our understanding of Jesus, of who he is, of what he's done and what relevance he has for you and for me this morning. He is without sin. John says, yes, he's he's fully divine. And yes, he's he's fully human. And and we've seen him and we, we hear him and our hands have touched him. He is in all ways point, uh, tempted just as we are, yet he is without sin. It's such an important thing for us to, to understand this morning. It's such an important thing for us to take in that Jesus, as we see him, as we think of him, as we worship him this morning, was sinless through his life. And it, it, it's important for us to understand that. This morning, that through his earthly life from Bethlehem, through Nazareth, through his ministry, 
through the miracles that he did, through his wonderful teaching, through to Jerusalem, and the Last Supper, and the Garden of Gethsemane, his trial, all the way through to his death on the cross of Calvary. This thing is a constant. Jesus, though tempted in all ways as we are, is without sin. Perfect in every way. Pure in every way. Sinless in deed. Sinless in thought. Sinless in motive. It's important for, un for us to understand, and perhaps this morning, quite difficult for us to understand, because apart from Jesus, we have no other example of anyone who that can be said about. It has never been done before. It has never been seen before. This world has never experienced it before. History had never seen it before. And in fact, history has never seen it since. Jesus stands unique in all of human history, in all of creation, as someone who is totally sinless. And so it's a special event going further than that this morning. It's a unique event in all of creation, in all of human history. For the first time ever, a sinless person walks in the world. A sinless person is part of humanity. Adam and Eve, as we think about them this morning, they were the closest that we ever came to it before Christ. There was a time, the Bible would tell us, that Adam walked in sinless perfection before God created in the image of God. Yet tragically, as we read in the book of Genesis, unable to sustain that. Created in the image of God, walking sinless before God, but unable to sustain that. Because when temptation came, Adam and Eve fell into sin. The Bible is clear that everyone after that has been born in sin and lived in sin. Has been a, a sinner due to their birth and due to their nature and due to their practice. And that's how it was from Adam right up until the time of Jesus. And here is Jesus as we read about him this morning. Jesus who is tempted in every way just as we are. Jesus who is tempted in every way just as Adam was. Exactly the same as you and me. And yet this last phrase separates him out from the rest of humanity. From the rest of of creation. He is tempted in all ways, says Hebrews, yet he is without sin. Yet he maintains this walk of sinlessness in the world. If we look a little bit further into the life of Christ this morning, we will realize that that purity of Jesus is confirmed twice in his life, once by the human race that he is a part of, once by humanity who live with him. If you look into the gospel stories, you read of a time when Pilate, the Roman procurator, is given, the Bible says, authority by God to stand as judge over Jesus. That authority doesn't come from anyone else, it comes from God. And so Pilate stands in this very special place. He stands as judge over Jesus himself. And as you read the quite long and detailed story of the encounter between Jesus and Pilate, it's an uncomfortable one. And Pilate remains uncomfortable through it all. But Pilate speaks with him. Pilate questions him. Pilate interrogates him as he would anyone else. He examines him in great detail. He examines the evidence that is brought to him. And he questions Jesus in detail over all the things that he is accused of. At the end of the, of the trial, as, as Pilate has gone back and forth and agonized in his heart and in his spirit about what to do at the end of that trial, 
Pilate brings Jesus out to the people of Jerusalem. And he addresses the people of Jerusalem. And he tells them that he's going to have Jesus flogged, punished. That he's going to hand Jesus over to be crucified because of their will. Because of the hardness of the hearts of Jerusalem. But then he makes it clear to the crowd what his thoughts are. What his verdict is. And he says these words to the people of Jerusalem. Behold, he says, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Pilate, who had um, condemned Jesus to death, who had passed a, a sentence of crucifixion over him, yet he wants the crowd to know. He wants humanity to know. He wants anyone who is listening to him to know, look, I'm bringing him out to you and I want you to know for certain that I find no fault in him. The sinlessness of Christ, the purity of Christ, it's confirmed by the humanity that he is a part of. It's confirmed by Pilate in the gospel stories. Then secondly, the, the sinlessness of Christ is confirmed by an even higher authority than Pilate. When Jesus is baptised by John in the River Jordan, an incredible thing happens. You can read it in the Gospels. I've chosen Matthew this morning to have a look at. But this is what happens in Matthew's account of the baptism of Jesus by John in the river Jordan. Matthew says this, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The sinlessness of Jesus is confirmed through humanity. It's confirmed through Pilate, the Roman procurator, the, the judge. And yet it's confirmed by this so great uh, authority. This is God now confirming the sinlessness of his son. Pilate was good at what he did, I'm sure. Pilate left no stone unturned. Pilate dug and dug and dug to see what the reality, the truth of any situation was. But God takes it to a whole new level. God, who the Bible would declare as the one who is all-seeing and all-knowing, who understands everything, God from whom nothing is hidden, God who has the highest of standards. Yet God uniquely here in the life of Jesus pronounces him as perfectly pleasing. God confirming the sinlessness of Jesus, his son. It had never happened before and it never happened again. God who looks at a member of humanity, a member of the human race, looks at him in every way, sees and understands everything from his life, his deeds, his thoughts, his motives, and yet declares him, pronounces him as perfectly pleasing. It's a unique event in all of human history, never to be repeated. Jesus standing in his own strength and his own humanity and yet sinless. Sinless in the eyes of the hu human race that he was a part of, sinless in the eyes of Pilate, sinless in the eyes of God. Tempted in all ways, says Hebrews, yet without sin tempted in all ways as we are yet without 
sin. You know, and that statement that Jesus is tempted and yet is without sin, it only makes sense when viewed in the knowledge of the humanity of Jesus. It only makes sense when we realize that here is Jesus the man, a member of humanity in the same way that you and I are. If we were to view him this morning in his divinity, in his deity, then we would think, of course, he is sinless. To say he is sinless is to, is to say nothing special because God is the very definition of sinlessness. God is the very definition of holiness, of separation from sin. Isaiah chapter 6 tells us this, and it's an encounter between God and humanity. This is what Isaiah says in chapter 6 of his book. He says in verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the foundation of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You know, that is God, separate from sin, separate from sinners, holy, holy, holy. That's God. And if we view Jesus in his deity and in his divinity, well, of course he's sinless. Of course he's pure. Of course he's holy. We would be saying nothing special then or nothing relevant then. Yet Jesus remains sinless in his humanity. Jesus is holy in his humanity. Remember those words from John saying, we have heard him. We have seen him with our own eyes. We have looked upon him. Our hands have handled him. And so this morning, as we look at this verse, we realize that Christ, that Jesus, is sinless in his humanity. And so he stands at the end of this verse in 1 John and chapter 1 as the unique representative of sinless humanity. There's him and only him. Only he stands in this position of being human as we are, tempted in all ways as we are, yet without sin. Only Christ can that be said of. We're going to come to a, a close there and now look at that verse. And then next week, God willing, we're going to start to look at what Jesus does with the sinlessness of his humanity. We're going to look at the reason why Jesus has come in human flesh and has lived a sinless life, what he is going to do with the sinlessness of his humanity. That's next week, God willing. Let me just remind you before uh, we come to a close uh, this morning that we'll be gathering together again on Wednesday evening, as uh, as we have done over these last couple of months. At Wednesday, on Wednesday at 7 o'clock, uh, as we uh, continue now, look at the, the book of Mark, and we're looking at the Last Supper, in the book of Mark, and we are um, looking at it and, and comparing it to our own communion services and Eucharist services or sacrament services. We can, we're going to continue that thought and that study on uh, Wednesday at, at seven o'clock, and it would be lovely if you could join me, so I'm not just talking to myself. If you could join me on our Facebook page or our YouTube page, uh, that would be great. Uh, and we're going to close our uh, service, our time this morning, uh, with a time of prayer. And uh, perhaps a little bit of a different time of prayer this morning on, on Friday. I'm sure that you were um, 
like me that you were the same as me as we watched the the news um with horror on on Friday afternoon and Friday evening and we saw those dreadful events those tragic events that happened just a, a few miles up the road in our own community uh in Triorki that have ended up with with people uh seriously injured in hospital with with people who've been under arrest uh and the most heartbreaking of all a, a 16 year old girl who was tragically lost her life and so as we um close our service in prayer this morning we're going to remember that situation and we're going to bring that situation before the lord uh in prayer we're going to ask him to undertake and to to help in the the helplessness of that situation we ask him to be with that um grieving family and to be everything uh that they stand in need of as we close our service this morning in prayer let's pray together shall we lord we do thank you for uh, your presence with us this morning lord we thank you for this time that we can share together as we come around your word lord and as we spend these moments praising and glorifying you in name lord remembering how good you are and the wonderful things that you do for us and glorifying you because of that lord we think of those events lord that we have seen in our own community over these last couple of days lord in this they've been difficult to hear it's been terrible to hear lord in it's difficult really to know what to ask this morning lord but what we can do is we can put that situation into your hands Lord there is nothing that is too difficult for you and I pray Lord that you would undertake and I pray Lord that you would enter in to that dreadful situation Lord we we can only imagine the things that that family is going through and we pray Lord that you would be the god of all comfort even to them Lord that you would wrap your loving arms around and about them that you would bring them you a peace and you a comfort lord it's a, a a dreadful situation lord but i pray that you would enter in and i pray lord that you would do what you only you can do lord we we could feel so helpless and not know where to start but this is the place to start lord to to hand it over to you lord and to ask you to do what only you can do I pray even through this these tragic events Lord Lord that the, the hearts of of men and women might turn to you as we realize Lord the frailty of life and how life can end so so very very quickly Lord that in the midst of all that we might turn to you the God who who would give us eternal life through faith and trust in you and your son Lord we thank you for the things that we've seen and heard of Jesus as we've read your word this morning. Lord we thank you that he came that he left the glory of heaven that he came to where we were Lord that he lived a sinless life and died in our room and in our stead. We thank you Lord that there is salvation through no other save the name of Jesus. And we thank you for Jesus our savior this morning and we pray Lord that in these days and weeks to come Lord as we go into a a new week Lord we thank you that you will be with us in each and every situation we pray that Lord that you would bless us and that you would look after us Lord we would put this uh pandemic that we are going through into your hands we would pray Lord that it wouldn't be too long before we are able to meet up again and able to fellowship in the church in Clitheroe lord we we want to do that that's our, our heart's desire lord is to is to come together and to worship and to praise you and to lift our voices in praise and adoration in you to you a wonderful name lord and i would leave that in your wonderful hands uh this morning be with everyone who would need a special touch from you this morning lord be everything that we stand in need of in jesus name amen